Welcome to the fifth lecture of Dynamics of Fork and Energy of Particles. Let's see if it depends. Okay. This is basically a continuation of the fourth lecture. And we talked about having angular momentum versus applied torque for several particles, angular momentum and impulse, and an example. And I promised all that in the last lecture, but didn't quite uh, deliver it. And this is what we're going to be talking about this time. Now, one thing you want to watch out about is the fact that, that the derivations look complicated, but they're not. Uh, the, the biggest complication is the good old summation sign in all of this. If you write them out for yourself, you'll see that they're not really that bad. And again, the best way for you to learn this is to try it out yourself. Um, watching it is one thing, but doing it is entirely another. This is really a multi-particle multi analog of single particle theory. So all of the single particle stuff that we've done already is really applicable to multiple particles. And the results are exactly the same. It's just the complicating factor is the fact that we're using several particles rather than just one. So as an example, maybe we might take a look at um, manipulator, manipulator arm dynamics. And this is in a, a horizontal plane, for example. All right. So we don't have to worry about gravity here particularly. But we do have two masses, m and m here. And they happen to both be the same mass. All right. All right. So we have the same masses there. And what we're looking for is how it behaves. The equations that would describe this motion are complex. And even without, without linearization, you can imagine here already that the motion of this particular mass, well, that's going to be nonlinear. And the motion of this second mass with regard to the first mass, that's nonlinear as well. And it turns out that the motion of this second mass with respect, with respect to a fixed coordinate system is going to be especially nonlinear. Okay. And if we use linearization, it's really impractical for uh, robotics because very often um, when we're talking about using linearization, we're talking about saying that cosine of theta, well, we'll treat that just as 1, and sine theta, that's approximately theta. But for robotics, say, maybe this, this value of theta is 45 degrees, maybe it's 0, maybe it's 90. Um, we need to have the motion of this arm over, over long distances, and in these situations, the linearization just won't work. So in these kinds of cases, we'd have to do some sort of um, uh, online analysis. Um, you might code this up in Fortran or C or something to, to run concurrent analysis as you're running the system, or to do some sort of analysis prior that, you know, via Mathematica or something along those lines. OK, so let's get to it. Um, for a single particle, we had the kinetic energy is equal to 1 half m times v dot v. And for several particles, however, we'll define the, just the, the total kinetic energy is just a sum of the, the corresponding kinetic energies because this is a scalar quantity after all. And, so, and where these, each of these, each of these is defined by the ith mass and its velocity. So mi vi dot vi with the one half in here, of course. Now, the, another way to look at it is, is we can split up the kinetic energy in terms of the motion of the center of mass here. Where this is, notice this is the total mass here in the M. We have the velocity of the center of mass squared, or in other words, V, this is actually VC dot VC, right? And then we have MI, rho dot I, rho dot I, uh, as written here as well, okay? So you can write it out in terms of the motion of the center of mass and motion of the ith particle relative to the center of mass, where this, this rho dot i is with respect to the CG, the center of gravity or center of mass. All right, so this also means a center of mass. It's unfortunate, but people will write center of gravity and center of mass and intend to mean the same things, and they aren't always the same thing. Potential energy and work done by forces applied to each of the particles add up in a similar way. So if we were to write uh, each particle has a potential energy V sub i, 
the total potential energy is just given by the summation of that. Similarly, if we do work on each of the particles, it should be an equal sign here, the work on each of the particles is, is W sub i, and that's equal to F sub i dot dr sub i. Notice that we're not including We're not including the internal forces here. It's only the external forces. And that's generally true. Uh, we don't have work done by the internal forces on each of these particles. The work here, the total work, is the summation of each of the, each of the bits of work. All right? And where the individual contributions of the internal forces are canceling out is when we take this summation. From before, we had Newton's second law for a group of particles, if you remember. So, and this is again, we're assuming that then mi dot is equal to zero, right? So we have mass times acceleration, r sub i double dot is equal to the sum of the forces, uh, external forces on, on the ice particle, right? And if we add everything up for all the particles in the group, this is the equation we'd have. And if we integrate this with respect to time, then what we'd end up with is we'd say we'd have a total impulse by all external forces. We call that F hat with an underbar for lack of having a better term. And then, so this is the, all the impulses on all the particles, right, by the, all the external forces. And then this is the total linear, linear momentum at the end of a time period, so at time t equals t2. And then we subtract off the total linear momentum at the beginning of the time period, t is equal to t1. The, th the interesting thing about this is, is that the total linear momentum is given by the total mass of the particle times the velocity of the mass center, right? So we're just looking at the, the total mass of, the, of the, all the particles together and then looking at how that, how the velocity of a mass center changes. That is related back to the impulse that's put on each of the particles over that period of time. And if you remember from before, we had the angular momentum is equal to Right, rho dot rho cross p, where rho is our moment arm, and then of course p is our momentum, our linear momentum. Okay, and in this case, so if we replace the momentum by its definition, that's m r dot, and then our, then we would use our angular momentum in sort of the equation for Newton's second law about a particular point, B, as long as B is a fixed point, this, this moment about B is equal to the time derivative of the angular momentum about B. And if B is moving, then we have to have a correction there. Um, the angular momentum is still fine, but we still have to worry about this, this other term. Remember in the previous notes we wrote V sub B, V sub B and R sub B dot is the same thing. This is a figure that we, we might use here, where we have maybe the mass center, and we'll have a fixed point O here, all right? And we have an ith particle out of many, many particles. And, and for clarity's sake, we're going to write only the ith particle. So this particular particle here is just the ith particle. It has a mass m sub i, has a velocity r sub i dot. Its position is given from a fixed point, O, say by r sub i, right? And then we have uh, the mass center, perhaps, okay? And we'll say that the, the, the vector to the mass